The following is a Journeywise Network production. Hey friends, welcome to the Journeywise podcast. I'm so excited to be with you. I'm Shane Stanford. I'm Ronnie Kent. And I'm James Kent. And we are wanting to have conversations at the intersection of faith and wellness. And what that means in terms of taking what you believe, what you consider to be important in your faith walk, and how does it inform the rest of your life? Uh, we believe in wellness uh, yes, in right. every corner of our of our being, and um, and therefore we think it's important. And faith, I think, informs wellness so much, and in, and wellness informs faith. Right. Uh, if you they're, don't feel good, that's right. They're absolutely connected, and I don't think we talk enough about that. Before we get started, I want to do a, just a shameless no. personal plug here. <laughs> shameless. In fact, why don't you hold the book? And it, seems like, <laughs> it seems less shameless. Uh, this is our our new book out, Journey Wise. And uh, it's about the Beatitudes, uh, kind of a unique take on the Beatitudes. And you can go to journeywise.network and learn more about it and even purchase a copy. <laughs> we would rather you learn about it and purchase a copy. So thank you for that. Um, today, guys, our topic, I'm trying to be a little bit lighthearted because our topic is not lighthearted. Um, we've been talking throughout this season at about things that happen emotionally, relationally at certain intersections. And I think one of the most important intersections that I've dealt with as a pastor, but also as a person who's dealt with uh, with illness, has been the whole idea of loss. And I think the, 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 the varied emotions that you have, how it affects your relationships, how it affects the way you see the world. And I wanted us to just talk about what happens when you face loss and what is the biblical wisdom that comes with those who are facing loss that they can know they have hope. So, um, Ronnie, I want to start with you. I know that, you know, when I was um, moving out of the patient into the friend role, um, I remember that you were dealing with your father's uh, stroke and he was in a coma for 12 12, years. years. And uh, tell us a little bit about that, because that was sort of an elongated loss that seemed to happen over time, and then, of course, he did pass away. But what did you ex- what did you experience when you had that first loss, that immediate, he wasn't able to respond? Well, it was overwhelming because we were very close, uh, and it was not expected. And uh, it's very interesting, uh, my, my mom called me on a Sunday morning and uh, said, well, your dad's in the hospital. I said, well, what's going on? He said, uh, she said that he had gotten dizzy Mm-hmm. And so they carried him to the emergency room. He was fine. And, and they said, well, let's just put him in to, to observe and make sure everything's okay. And, and mom was talking out in the hospital room. Sure. And so I said, do I need to come now or just come after church? And she turned and, and asked him, James, does he need to come now or come after church? He said, tell the boy to go to church. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be just fine. Wow. And so that's the last thing I heard my dad say. Wow. And so by the time, and, and you know, it's very real interesting, Shane, because, you know, I, any, any significant event, be it positive or negative, you know, one of my prayers always is, God, don't let me miss you in this event. Mm. Uh, and so don't make it about the event, make it about you. Mm. And, and I prayed that prayer going down there. And when I got down there, you know, I met my mother, when I went up to the floor where he was, they said he's been moved to intensive care and he was in surgery or, you know, he was in surgery at that time um, and to decompress the swelling because then they had realized that he was progressing into a massive stroke. Uh, and the, the neurosurgeon came out, I, I distinctly remember this, and, and to talk to us and he, and he said he's had a bad stroke in a bad place. Hmm. Um, and it kind of locks the, he had a basilar artery stroke, which means the, the, the stroke that connects your brain to the rest of your body was, was affected. So, wow. um, so, you know, we never knew exactly how much he could hear or not hear and all that sort of stuff, but it was, it was overwhelming. I, I spent a lot of time in that intensive care for the next three days because I didn't go home. I, I stayed in the intensive care where he was, yeah. sent mom home and all. And, uh, and God and I had some very interesting conversations. Mm. Those happened during loss. Yes. And uh, I don't know if you want to share it, but the, uh, what was some of the conversation 
that well, you have during those moments? You know, I, I think there's, and James probably speak to this, I know he will, but, but there's the acute loss, and then there's the loss, the, the chronic part of loss. Yeah. And you, like you say, mine was mo much more of a chronic kind of a loss because it, it was in that, I really thought dad was going to be healed. And, and I had an experience that I, I really don't share because I, I still don't know how to take it. Uh, in that in that room, another person who who, who later I thought might have been an angel mm -hmm. that came and kind of ministered to me because the, the came in and uh, said your uh, a housekeeper actually said you know you, are you you have somebody in intensive care I said yes and said and and as she turned to walk away she said I'm so sorry as she turned to walk walk away she looked back at me and this and I remember the look on her face of of a, a very comforting look to me and said your father will be fine. Almost the same thing that Dad had said to me. Sure, and and so and I, you know, and you took that immediately yes, to be, be he'll be back up and he'll be fine. back up and going physically yeah. fine. And so I I I ran way ahead of God hmm. and thought I knew His will for a long time, sure. uh, and 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 so in do, and God and I had to work through that. Hmm. And I think that with loss that that. The losses I've experienced, that's the whole thing. You have to work through it with God. Uh, it's not, it's not to me an immediate, or in my experience, it's not an immediate thing. It's God drawing you to himself and wanting you, to, you know, 2 Corinthians 1 is where I send everybody with loss, that we are comforted with the comfort from God so that we can comfort others. You know, when you talk about loss, I, I think about people who in the church and, and in those circumstances that are that are moved by the Holy Spirit to say something to someone in those circumstances. And I've had a lot of people that I've will come and say to me, I'm going to pray for you and you're going to be healed, and then have seen me later and I'm not healed, and I have to minister to them because they are just devastated. Mm. And, my, and the common denominator, I tell people, I'll say, but you know, you did tell me that God loved me. You reminded me that God loved me and that one day I will be fine. Mm -hmm. I will be healed. Just like your dad is, was fine. He's, He's fine. fine. He is fine. But that is such a difficult thing to deal with because we are wound up, uh, especially for those that we invest ourselves deeply in loving. That is the second beatitude. Mm -hmm. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And I think Jesus is saying in that second beatitude, He's using a word for those who, are, who don't hesitate to love, those who invest everything, even at the risk of not of losing that. Right. Um, one of the... Uh, the books that someone gave me a few years ago was a was a kind of a, a variation of the gospel story written in narrative form from the perspective of Mary Magdalene. Mm. And I I remember you know because everybody kept trying to make them a couple and all that and they, and they you know, Jesus and Mary Magdalene both kept going that's not what we are that's not who we are while we're while I'm following him, but there was a scene in there after the res after the the resurrection. I keep in mind that she's already experienced the power of the resurrection, right. and now he's told her, "But I can't, I can't stay with you," and she is absolutely almost apoplectic in the story, the way it's told, because she's gone through such trauma, right. and the, and now the prayer seemed to be answered, but it wasn't answered to the way she wanted it answered. Right. And I've thought a lot about that because I think the human condition is is programmed to deal with grief in very particular ways, and James. As a, as a psychologist and someone who um, helps people guide through grief, I think all three of us, of course, have done that. What are, what are the stages of grief? What are the things that people deal with whenever they have to face loss in their life? Sure. Um, as the theory states it, there are five stages of grief. Um, the first being denial and then anger and then bargaining and then depression and then acceptance. And all of them. I've done them all well. <laughs> you know, I really have experienced all well, of Well, if you're healthy, you, you, you pretty much have to. Yeah. One of the things I would always tell people is the only way through grief is through it. Um, yeah. You know, you really do have to engage those feelings and um, those questions and that pain uh, to move forward. And it's a, it's a really difficult process. It can be a really lonely process for people, too. What do you think is, and I, I, I know this is a cold question, so I, I give you a minute, but what do you think is the hardest stage of grief? What's the one that's most difficult for people? 
I mean, tax. Yeah, and, okay, let me. Yeah. While he's thinking of the professional <coughs> answer, let me think of the. Let me tell you the personal answer. Sure. Mine uh, was anger. Yeah. I mean, because um, th about three years into my dad's, and, and his has been my greatest struggle. I mean, you know, sure. it, that loss was my greatest loss to date. So, um, and and because my mother is 102, she still. So I don't want to take away from my relationship with my mother, and, and, and <laughs> sure. but but she's still around. Uh, but I, I distinctly remember about the third year uh, over his bed talking with him. And kind of it was a three-way conversation. <laughs> I was talking to him and God kind of at the same time. Sure. And um, and and I, I I said, God, this man honored you hmm. every step of his life, and he loved you. You know, I used to watch him read his Bible, how much he got out of it. And he and I said, and and it's a wonder I'm still here. Uh, but I said, if this is what you call the abundant life, I'm not so sure I want it. Hmm. And, you know, because as much as my dad loved me, I knew God loved me more. Yeah. And so I had, to, I had to get to that place where I said that out loud for myself. Yes. That, that then I could, I could let God come in and say, that's okay. Well, I remember when I did the... You know, I am so disappointed in you. Speech to God, <laughs> and and really, <laughs> and after it came out of my mouth, I was like, "Well, that was stupid," <laughs> but it wasn't stupid. It was the you know saying, "You know, I really am I'm, I'm disappointed. I don't know what all this is for, but I'm still living in a tit for tat kind of world. Right. Where if I do this, God will do that, right. and that's not oh. the way it works." Well, see, this was the first time God had not. Answer. That I had, yeah. That I had not pulled the handle. Yeah, exactly. And, and the, the, <laughs> the 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 jackpot came. I mean, really, literally. I mean, I did. Did God do everything I wanted Him to do? No. Sure. But I could see Him moving in every significant issue. I mean, you know, answering, but well, just a lot. Anyway, and and He was silent. Mm. Mm. James. Yeah, I, I would say. Um, maybe a, a layered response to your question, and that would be there's actually a diagnosis uh, called complicated bereavement. Um, and essentially it's when someone gets stuck in one of the stages. And so I would say um, I think it's a it's probably not a one-size-fits-all what's the hardest stage. I would say any stage that causes someone to get stuck yeah. is going to be the most difficult because each stage, stage raises different questions, different emotions, different, um, uh, you know, why. <laughs> sure. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's how I would respond is any stage that causes someone to get stuck or the most stuck. Hmm. How does, and I, I'm going to ask the question, so any, any stage along those five stages that they get stuck, whether it's angle or uh, denial or anger mm -hmm. or uh, bargaining or whatever it might be, um, which one do you think has the most complications for everything else in your life in terms of what stage which is the most difficult for those around you probably anger or depression yeah. um, because anger has consequences yeah and depression you know it's just hard to do much at all and so there's going to be consequences to that as well I would say both are going to affect probably every domain of life um, relationships occupation um, maybe finances so I mean one of those two, I would think. Do you think, is it interesting <coughs> to you that bargaining sits in the middle? Isn't it bargaining that's in the middle, number three? Mm -hmm. Is it interesting that it sits right there in the middle? Because the, the last two seem to be you're over the mountain and you're, you know, you're sliding into acceptance. But you know, bargaining is interesting to me because I never fully understood how it affected you until I started doing it. You know, came out of anger and started, you know, then I started, ha I would invest myself, I married, then we started having children. And so I started having things that really mattered to me, mm -hmm. things that I was deeply invested in that I did not want. And I remember um, when we were pregnant with my oldest daughter, we had gone to great lengths to make sure that my wife would not con con contract um, HIV and everything else that I had. And that my daughter wouldn't. And six months into pregnancy, my wife's giving me factors, trips, and sticks herself with my needle. And so she's six months pregnant, 
and we have to go get that test done. And I remember going, the doctor we went to was our, was her OB, uh, another wonderful man of God. And I was just in high bargaining mode, and even to the point that I was saying to him, you know, hey, I, I need you to participate with me in this, mm-hmm. you know, and we're going <laughs> to tell God if this happened, you know, then we'll we'll do these things. And I remember he looked at me and he said, you know, it just, that, that's not God's economy. We don't bargain in God's economy. And I'll never forget that phrase that, because bargaining to me is the place where things can get the most out of whack. Mm-hmm. Anger Anger's dangerous. Of course, denial is rough. Yeah, I could see that. But bargaining can get very unsettled because you start putting, things start shifting on you. Priorities, um, energy, focus. W- would you agree with that? Well, just think, you know, denial eventually is going to end. I mean, because sure. the facts are facts. Yeah. Anger is pretty obvious yeah. to the people around you most of the time. I mean, if you're, if you're, because it, like James said, it affects everything, you know, occupation, family, everything. But bargaining can go on pretty much. Yeah. You, you can, you can get into chronic bargaining, you know, now I'll do this for you, God, yeah. if you'll, you know, I'll do, what about this? And you can you don't be have, a bit sporadic with yes. your mindset. I mean, and it's you can actually come out of bargaining when something good does, yeah. does do something good for you. Then you're out it's of going, working. Well, it's working. Oh, okay, right. thank you, God. I'll be. I'll take it from here. <laughs> yeah. um, and and to me that is so dangerous because I think that leads into a lot of other issues of self interest and 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 trying to be your own God and trying to navigate things. Um, it's that little wedge. Yes. Bargaining be- can become such a wedge that can keep pushing you, pushing away. Well, all of a sudden you get to the place where, ah, you know, I don't need you, God. Mm-hmm. I'm okay. It's, it's kind of that behind, get behind me Satan moment Jesus had, you know. There's an opportunity that's presented that it's like that's not the path. And he has to say, whoa, you yeah. know. Well, and, and you know what's interesting about that, and I've actually heard someone preach that Jesus was bargaining with God. That is not bargaining. Mm. It is the opposite mm. of right. bargaining. Mm-hmm. It is, he was shutting this it down. is what I would <laughs> yeah. prefer, yeah. Like, yeah. but yeah. I'm going to do your will. Right. And, and Jesus knew what his will was. Mm-hmm. You know, he just, so it's okay to be able to say to God in times of great grief and in times of great loss, this is how I feel, right? Oh, at, you better. Yeah. Well, yeah. and there's real insight, I think, that, in therapy, one of the things you want to help people see is that they are in that stage of bargaining. Um, <clears throat> because once you see that, uh, you can you can start talking about why it is that you're you're going through that. And the main reason is because you feel like you would pretty much give anything to get back whatever it is that you lost. Um, and bargaining gives you more control. Denial, you're you're out of control. Anger, you're really out of control. But bargaining starts moving you back into this for that. And control, I'm telling you, it's, I think it's the root of all sin, hmm. is who's going to be God. Gonna it, be God. Start, it started with Adam and Eve. You can be like God. Oh, I'll, 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 make, I'll make the decision of how I want to do that. And so bargaining starts saying, okay, I'm getting some control back. Hmm. And, that, and that's kind of what you're talking about. You can, you can really get into a real deep pit. And, and the greatest fear is not needing God. I'm, I'm thinking because I think primary issues of loss, I think we know we're ready for it. You know, we can start working our way through the stages of grief. There's also experiences that happen that are not as primary as losing a father or losing a friend or whatever it might yeah. be, that you do experience stages of grief. Absolutely. And it's very yes. difficult to recognize and do that. I, uh, the, the situation where the four-year-old died in the pool, and I got to the pool first and the, the, at the grandparents' house. And for weeks after that, I could not figure out what was wrong with me. And what I, I realized that I was feeling the loss of that child, even though that wasn't my child, even though it wasn't my family. Um, and I do think there is a lot of that, especially as we invest ourselves more in the world, as we try to be with people and be on their journeys, I think we start to feel a lot of the pain that they're feeling and experience that as a physician did you ever feel oh, that all, all the time and you have to it, it, you know it's that we do it and i know james had to do it you have to do it as a pastor every time you have to learn how to have as much compassion as you can s- sympathy without really being empathetic yeah 
I mean, chronic empathy will wear you out. Yes. You know, now you can, you, you don't, you don't want to get into their shoes. You want to come alongside them and support them, try to prop them or hold them up so that they can move through the, the loss appropriately. But you, you don't want to have to take that pain on every time because uh, I, I don't think, I mean, I couldn't take it. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how, gee, and when it, and so what I would keep thinking about is the whole sin of the world, all the brokenness of the world was put onto him. I mean, the, the spiritual burden was nothing, the cross was nothing compared the to that spirit, burden. Yeah. So, okay, in our last few minutes, uh, what are some things that people can do when they are in, when they enter loss? What are some things they need to do? Well, um, like you said, first of all, I mean, recognize the loss. Uh, I mean, some of them are obvious, like you said, the death of someone close. But... Um, I think some people don't realize that you can go through grief over the loss of a job or, um, you know, some circumstance that, because because really it all boils down to a loss of expectation. Sure. Um, what I thought was going to happen didn't happen. And so um, just to recognize the loss first and foremost, and then, uh, you know, know that you need time. You'll need to uh, be intentional about going through those emotions and memories and um much like being a mississippi state fan <laughs> no just kidding sorry. very similar actually sorry, yeah very similar <laughs> sorry oh, no. sorry to all our mississippi state fans. very similar um <laughs> <laughs> so true but but uh yeah so you yeah just right just triggered me um triggered him but you have to allow space. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is uh, if you can do it with somebody, mm -hmm. um, it, regardless of whether they went through it or, or are experiencing the same level of loss, I mean, just a hand to hold, um, shoulder to cry on. Uh, because like I said earlier, it can be a really lonely experience for people. Um, but those are the things I would say that are really, and again, if you find yourself stuck, Go see a counselor, see your pastor, and um, talk through it. That's a big thing is, is talk about it. Um, I used to encourage patients all the time to almost schedule time mm -hmm. for uh, stories with loved ones that yeah. they would talk about whoever they lost. Um, just great. because it's, it's food for the soul, but, um, you know, sometimes that food just doesn't taste good, but it's still necessary. Um, well, if for someone who's out there experiencing loss, and it, not just maybe the loss of death of a loved one, but any type of loss like James is talking about, um, we we encourage you to listen to what James said, um, but also be prepared to know, and I believe this firmly because it's happened in my life, God is always prepared to angle someone into your mm -hmm. path mm -hmm. at those intersections. And, and sometimes the least... Uh, <laughs> usual suspect. I mean, you, uh, you're you the most unusual of suspects, but yet God knows what you need better than you know it. And I think one of the comments that he makes, and I just, friends, I want you to hear this, is that if, if the Holy Spirit is so close that he can pray prayers that we don't even have words for, he can also pray prayers for topics that we don't even know what we're asking for. Right. And he wants to be that, 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 um, um, intercessor for you between you and the father and so i pray that you'll you'll start there and maybe like you said a good point and say you know what father i'm i am lost i am broken yeah. so now i get emotional <laughs> um let's uh let's pray for those who are lost oh, yeah father i thank you so much that you're god who loves us i thank you for the ways that you bless us for the ways that you work in our lives I thank you for the fact that you remind us in so many different ways in Scripture that you are there with us every step along the way. Uh, and that, Father, if we feel far from you, we're not the ones who, are, who are, have proximity issues. You're, you're not the one who has proximity issues. We are. And, Father, we just want to be aware of your presence and then to live faithfully into that. And that's what I pray for every person right now who's listening to this, who's going through loss or difficulty in their life, Father, who's, who's mourning something to know, as the Beatitude says, they will be comforted. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a promise that God makes, and that, that comfort is only, um, it's, it's sitting right there for the asking. Um, it's, 
doesn't come on a timetable. It doesn't make an appointment. It, it oftentimes is not understood. Many times the comfort that I've received doesn't come when I want it to. Uh, but Father, it always comes. And I thank you for the prayer journal that I keep that I look back over the years and I see where you provided comfort. You angled someone into my path. And I know that you're willing and able to do that for anybody who's listening. And so, Father, I thank you for these two men. I thank you for the word that you uh, have shared through us today, Father, for that person who needs to hear this, who's going through loss in whatever form it may be, that they may find hope and they may find uh, peace and that they may find strength walking with you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you're struggling with loss or grief, send us an email at info at morewestcenter.org to have one of our JourneyWise pastors reach out to you. We are available to speak with and pray with you.